Welcome back now to the main issue for the day. The decision to impose a tax on gains from the disposal of digital assets reflects the government recognition of the economic potentials of cryptos. The global cryptocurrency market has witnessed remarkable growth in recent years with digital assets gaining wider acceptance as alternative investment options. By taxing gains from the disposal of these assets, the Nigerian government aims to capture a portion of economic value generated from these transactions contributing to the country's overall revenue stream. Now joining me now to discuss further on this is the CEO of Black, George Omoso. Many thanks for joining me, George. Good morning to you. Morning. All right, let's just dive straight to it. What are the significant implications of the introduction of these tax on gains from the disposal of digital assets for the nation's economy? Um, thank you so much for that question, Justin. Um, first of all, before I even say anything, I would like to you know, put it out there that um, I am pro-tax. I, um, I, 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 I am fully aware of the benefits that you know, taxes have on you know, the state. However, I do believe that the taxes that are being imposed on you know, cryptocurrency at this point in time are early. You know, and the reason I say that is because um, if you consider countries like Dubai and Portugal, these countries have a 0% uh, taxation uh, policy. You know, and that's you know, obviously because they, they, they understand that the industry is relatively new and the industry is... I would like to liken the, the cryptocurrency landscape in Nigeria to the baby of a giant. And, you know, what I mean by that is it, it, it appears as, you know, something that's mature, as something that is ripe, as something that is, you know, ready, that, that looks massive. There's a lot of noise and a lot of conversation, you know, around uh, what, you know, the things happening in the cryptocurrency landscape. However, it's still immature. It's still very young. It's still very tender, right? So the imposition of these taxes, I believe, um, it, it have adverse a lot of adverse effects um, mm -hmm. towards contributing to um, startups being scared to you know play in that space, and also it, it might deter a lot of the you know the early adopters from you know getting into that space. You okay. know, so which is why countries like Dubai and Portugal would impose 0% zero, zero taxes because they're looking to encourage a lot of um, influx of talents, crypto talents. I, I'm aware of some of the businesses yeah. who are actually clients and partners to um, us at Black who have actually moved their operations from other parts of Europe to Dubai to establish their crypto businesses there. And it's because these laws have taken into account the immature states of yeah. the cryptocurrency industry. I mean, you're aware, it's, it's relatively new, right? Yeah. So it, it needs to be given enough support. I believe the state should, first of all, prioritize giving support to the industry to, first of all, mature to the point where structures are built, institutions are built. Mm. When you have institutions, it's, it's, it's a lot easier to enforce government policies. Okay, fine. Since you, you talked about the immaturity and all of that, and you talked about um, countries uh, that um, have um, imposed just zero, as in no taxation on uh, the crypto space. So, uh, how long do you think we can get uh, or should take before we start talking about um, taxing these uh, digital assets? Um, I, I don't think it's a function of time alone. Okay. I think we, we need to be deliberate about the investment in the industry. Mm. You know, is the government having conversations with experts in this industry to, to gather data on the things that need to be put in place? You know, whether it's policies, whether it's, you know, partnerships, you know, with various institutions and organizations to see how best we can create a conducive environment for these you know, small businesses to become institutions. And the reason why this is extremely important is you, you, it, crypto is a decentralized technology by nature. Mm. It's extremely difficult to police, right? Governments are centralized organizations. So if the government intends to be able to tax a decentralized system, mm. they need to become the underlying platform that organizations are built upon. Oh. You know, it, it has to be willful. 
organizations in the crypto space need to be able to identify the benefits that the state is providing for their organizations to thrive such that paying taxes mm. will not be an unwillful endeavor. If I understand that, you know, there's a value exchange going on, which is why nobody has problems with paying money and receiving a good of commensurate value. Right. It's because the idea of value exchange is something that, you know, is, is that cuts across um, everyone, right? So if I understand that paying my taxes makes this environment conducive for me to continue to do business, continue to thrive, I won't have any problem with it. Mm -hmm. And the government should understand that from a technical standpoint, they can't even um, enforce these things unless you know these companies and these players in this space are you know working together with the government in order to achieve that. It's right. extremely important. All right, George. Now let me look at it from another angle because uh, a school of thought uh, believes that uh, this development. Uh, actually means that uh, government has acknowledged the legitimacy and the potential of um, digital assets or uh, what they have or what they hold for economic development of the country. Do you agree? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I, I'm, I'm very excited that the government is actually acknowledging these things because it, it, it's, it's creating an environment where investors can be more, um, feel more secure and more um, encouraged to get into that space because whenever the state is involved obviously there's more stability in, in the industry, there's more certainty because the state has an obligation to the people, right? So that acknowledgement is good. However I would say that if if, if if you asked me the taxes, there should be certain tax concessions for particularly the startups, okay. the young businesses, the new businesses the new players in the space you know, and, and that, that can gradually grow as the businesses themselves grow. All right. Uh, so another angle, again, to look at it would be that uh, uh, the inclusion of digital assets within the tax framework uh, would actually help to address some of uh, the regulatory challenges associated with cryptos. Do you agree? I do not agree. <laughs> okay. I do not agree. Um, mm. <laughs> I don't agree. You know, because like I said, the nature of the technology is decentralized, right? Mm. Um, everyone has a say when it comes to crypto. There is no one party that is above another party. Yes, some wallets have, you know, more zeros um, inside of them than some others, but everyone is equal, you know, when it comes to crypto and blockchain technologies at large. So, you know, simply enforcing taxes um, will not regulate the technology, it's not going to regulate the industry, mm. right? Which is why, like I said, the government needs to be working hand in hand in concert with, you know, industries, helping to first and foremost build them up to the point where they become institutions, institutions that trust and rely on the government, who then voluntarily, you know, would want to work in concert with the government to achieve the government's aims. That's the, the only way I see here in order to achieve this. Okay, let's just uh, digress a little bit, although still talking about cryptocurrency. I want to understand what's really happening in the cryptoverse because uh, uh, specifically Bitcoin and its um, volatility, uh, you know, uh, sometime in January, uh, it touched about 116.5. That's um, the index. But right now, it's near 64. It's as though it's really dropping. What's happening in the cryptoverse? Um, crypto, like I said, you know, it's still very new, still very young. Um, we're still getting to understand uh, the, the dynamics of it. There have been a lot of things that have played, you know, different roles. Um, certain, uh, you know, key players, you know, have been brought to almost nothing, right? And these, 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 these events have actually affected the value or the valuation or the perceived valuation uh, mm. of the cryptocurrency. So it, it's a lot of events that have played out up to this point. Um, I, I don't think anyone can actually pinpoint one thing that has affected the trajectory of you know, the valuation of the Bitcoin or any of these other cryptocurrencies. I think they, they, I personally believe they are still not mature to the point of stability where it becomes predictable. So I, I would say let's give it a couple of years um, 
while deliberately investing in building, like I said, institutions, it's institutions that bring stability, yeah. that bring structure uh, to a terrain to the point where it becomes you know, more predictable. All right. Forward. Okay, as we round off um, this discourse right now, we've talked about, uh, you know, the seemingly uh, uh, infantile nature of um, this whole crypto. Uh, but what would you uh, advise, really, to the Nigerian government, in as much as uh, they have uh, begun to uh, acknowledge, uh, you know, what is actually inherent in that particular um, space? Uh, what more can they do in terms of um, regulations and all of that? Um, so, fir first of all, Seeing as this is a technology-centered terrain, um, I would strongly recommend having conversations with the technologists, um, inviting you know, a number of the key players and some of the underdogs as well to conversations um, for the purpose of understanding better the terrain in order to better design policies um, that have the potential to affect everyone. Um, so that, that, that's really what I would advise. Um, in terms of regulations, it's, 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 it, it, it's different for every industry. It's different for every business, right? Cryptocurrency is really just, it's a financial um, technology, right? And it applies differently to different businesses because every business engages in transactions. Um, so for every you know, business or sub-business under the industry, um, the regulatory policies might differ. You know, so I would really strongly recommend having conversations with the technologists and letting us play a very direct role in some of the formations of these policies, um, just so that they are better executed, better suited for the industry, and will potentially lead to long-term growth and sustainability. Well, right, thank you so much. I have been speaking with um, George Amoson, the CEO of Black. Many thanks for all of the useful insights that uh, you have provided today. Thank you. All right, as we go today on the show, the Association of Mobile Money and Bank Agents in Nigeria, Amben, has vowed to ensure the implementation of the frameworks put in place by the Central Bank of Nigeria to ensure compliance by members. National President of Amben, Victor Olojo, flanked by other officials, said this while addressing newsmen on some issues raised by the House Committee on Banking and Currency with regards to agency banking and financial inclusion. I'll leave you with details of that. I'll see you again tomorrow. My name is Justin Akadone. Many thanks for watching. The impact of mobile money and agency banking hit a crescendo in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic and the lockdown, with active point-of-sale terminals used by merchants for financial transactions, recording about 3.1 trillion naira in the second quarter of 2021. The increase in the value of POS transactions in Nigeria shows the spending patterns of Nigerians and payment preferences, reaching all nook and cranny and, by extension, deepening the nation's financial inclusion drive. However, there have been complaints of proliferation of agents, lack of KYC to even issues of theft and other fraudulent activities. The Yamban executive spoke of a tax force for self-regulation while clarifying other grey areas. Just take one of the case studies. I mean, part of the framework of the CBN is that a mobile money or bank agent should be in a brick and mortar location, like an address that is traceable. But what we have today are agents under umbrellas, trees. We have agents who are walking this terminal. Rising from our fifth AMBA annual national conference held in Abuja last year. One of the resolutions that came out of our robust deliberations with all critical stakeholders was to begin self-regulation using our tax force. Victor Olojo lamented that the members are often on the receiving end when it came to counterfeited bills and other fraudulent activities, making a renewed call for adequate trading. There was a robbery case that happened in the East and um, somebody's phone was snatched and those um, you know, um, bad guys came to Lagos, they took the SIM and transferred the funds to an agent. You know, and the agent innocently actually served that customer, not knowing that that customer is actually you know, um, an arm robber. What we find out now is that those merchants now turn the outlet to a mobile money agent outlet. 
and that's not what the PRS is making meant for. And those that give out the PRS know that this is what is going on. But they do not query them because what they want, they want money. The growth in the number of POS businesses in the country has formed a major source of employment for Nigerians, especially the youths.